My name is Simon Beckett and I'm going to talk a little bit about my new novel, Written in Bone, which is a sequel to The Chemistry of Death and the second novel to feature the forensic anthropologist Dr David Hunter. When you're writing a sequel you have to, uh, have to be careful because you don't want it to be a carbon copy of the first novel, but then again it's got to contain the same sort of elements that people found appealing. Dr David Hunter is still the, uh, the main character in it, it's still told from his point of view, but instead of being set in Norfolk as Chemistry of Death was, it's set in, uh, it's in Scotland, it's on a remote Scottish island called Luna in the Outer Hebrides and it's set in winter rather than summer and also whereas the chemistry of death was concerned with decomposition Written in Bone is concerned very much with fire and specifically uh, a type of phenomenon that's known as spontaneous human combustion. Spontaneous human combustion is a bizarre phenomenon. Uh, it's different to things like UFOs and ghosts in as much as it's been so well documented. There's photographic evidence, there are police records of where this has apparently occurred. Uh, what it is, is where uh, an individual apparently, and I do say apparently, bursts into flames for no obvious reason. Uh, I can remember years and years ago I saw a photograph of a victim of spontaneous human combustion. It's a very, very famous photograph. It's, uh, it's been published in a lot of books, it's on the internet. And it was an American woman in the 1950s called Mary Reeser, uh, who has since been uh, given the unfortunate name of the Cinder Woman. Um, and she was actually found alone in a, a, locked, a locked apartment. She was burnt completely away. Her bones had been consumed. Um, there was just ashes left, apart from one of her, uh, one of her feet. That was still left from the, from the mid-shin down, and there was still a shoe on it. The thing about spontaneous human combustion is it is so bizarre. It doesn't look natural. You've got a, a pile of bones and ash left. Some parts of the body can, can remain completely untouched. The entire room can re uh, remain completely untouched apart from the body. It looks as though there's got to be some sort of supernatural explanation for it. What intrigued me was looking at this and seeing what the scientific explanation for this phenomenon could be. It's not like UFOs, it's not like ghosts. It actually exists, it's been documented. But whether or not it's paranormal, that remains to be seen. And of course, Dr. David Hunter doesn't believe for a minute that it is. When it came to research, um, I contacted a forensic anthropologist who's actually based in, in Scotland, who specialises in fire deaths. And he's actually worked cases such as the one that uh, I describe in the book of what, what appears to be spontaneous human combustion. Um, I've also been in touch with Scottish uh, police officers to find out about the fairly unique situation uh, that happens when you have to police remote islands where there is no easy form of transport, where there are no uh, telephone communication sometimes and where during a storm the island can be very easily cut off. Rhone is a fictional island um, but it's based on fact, much the same as Manham in uh, The Chemistry of Death was based on several Norfolk villages that actually existed so Rhone is a, a, a conglomeration if you like of actual Scottish islands. People who live on these islands do regard themselves as, as different, they regard themselves as very separate uh, and the more isolated the island is, then the more separate the people regard themselves and rumour is very, very separate and isolated from the, the rest of the, uh, the UK indeed. Apart from Dr David Hunter, the only character who's been carried over from the chemistry of death is Jenny, his girlfriend. The rest of the characters are completely new. Uh, there's Brodie, the retired police inspector who actually discovers the body in the first place. Uh, he's quite a sad character, he doesn't, you know, he's very much a policeman, he's, even though he's retired he can't shake the fact that he was, he was a cop um, and so he, he wants to become involved in the investigation, he wants to help out and as the book progresses David Hunter is very glad that he, you know, he can draw on his expertise. There's also Maggie who David Hunter is less pleased to see because she's a, she's a rather nosy journalist, um, he's quite a brash character, uh, very ambitious but she's not quite as hard nosed as she likes to make out. There is a, a soft centre there and there's a, there's a sort of attraction that springs up between her and David Hunter. Um, he, he warms to her in the end. There's also uh, a pair of characters called uh, Michael and Grace Strachan who I, I very much enjoyed writing. They're a very glamorous pair of, of South Africans who've, um, they're wealthy, they moved to the island, they made it their sort of retreat, they put a lot of money into renovating the place, everybody on the island thinks they're, you know, they're wonderful, they're the, they're the benefactors. Um, uh, but neither of them are very, very, very happy at all when they find out that uh, there's a potential murder that's been carried on there, because this is the, the serpent in their Garden of Eden, if you like. I hope that readers who enjoy The Chemistry of Death are also going to enjoy Written in Bone. There's a, a lot of the same elements are in both books really. Dr David Hunter's there again. Um, he's been pushed to the, the limit of his capabilities yet again. Um, 
there's twists, there's tension, there's a lot of forensics in there. There's also a lot of mystery and atmosphere, possibly even more mystery and atmosphere than those in The Chemistry of Death. And I hope as well that there might be one or two shocks in there that people really don't see coming.